Okay, uh, welcome to the last session of PZOCCOM. Uh, this is a session on measurements. Uh, I'm Walter Willinger from Nixon, and we have four papers that cover really a very range, wide range of uh, interesting topics in the area of network measurements. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce the first speaker. Uh, the first speaker is Ishan Kazi from uh, uh, University of Lahore, Computer Science Department. Uh, he is interested in sort of data center networking, censorship and privacy, and his talk is about censorship, which is, uh, I think, a very important and unfortunately increasingly widespread problem. So I'm very happy to uh, have you. So. Okay, so hi, uh, today I'm going to be talking about a work that we've been doing for the past couple of years on a building a new platform for measuring internet censorship that provides incentives for users to contribute measurements. This is joint work with two of our former undergraduate students, Akib Nassar Aksa Kashif, and my colleague Zatash at LUMS Pakistan. So internet censorship is rising globally with over 70 countries uh, censoring internet content in one way or the other, often due to political, social, and economic reason, reasons some of uh, the recent examples of censorship include the blocking of YouTube in Pakistan for four years, the censorship of Google in China, and the blocking of Twitter in Turkey. Censorship has a substantial impact on different stakeholders in the internet ecosystem, including users, ISPs, advertisers, content providers, and the government. And this has led to the design of censorship measurement platforms on the one hand, uh, that aim to ascertain what content is blocked, where is it blocked, how it is blocked, and when it is blocked, as well as circumvention systems that aim to bypass censorship. Unfortunately, uh, existing measurement and circumvention platforms are designed independently, uh, which leads to uh, uh, the following challenges. So as a result, these circumvention systems are not data-driven, which leads to one-size-fits-all solutions. For example, Relay-based, uh, proxy-based solutions like Tor and Lantern, they uh, use the same circumvention strategy independent of the deploy censorship. Similarly, sen existing censorship measurement systems lack incentives as they rely on volunteers or on buying uh, VPN services for measuring censorship, which limits the availability of geographically distributed vantage points. So in this work, we ask, uh, can we address the limitations of these individual systems by consolidating them in a single platform? We answer this question in the affirmative by designing Seesaw, which is a system that consolidates measurements and circumvention single platform. It uses crowdsourcing to collect measurements and uses these measurements to offer data-driven circumvention. Uh, data-driven circumvention leads to small page load times, uh, which incentivizes more users to actually opt in. Now I'll provide a brief background on how web censorship takes place today and some common forms of circumvention. So web filtering can be performed uh, by intercepting a user request at different levels of the protocol stack. When a user makes a DNS request, a sensor can, uh, can uh, manipulate the DNS responses resulting in either no resolution or a resolution which is incorrect. And this is known as DNS blocking. A sensor can also match the destination IP address against the blacklist of IP addresses and drop packets or reset the connection, which is known as IP blocking. When a client makes an attempt for an HTTP connection, the sensor can look at the, can, can intercept the GET request and look at uh, the, the uh, host field or the resource path to, to drop the connection, reset the connection, or, 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 or uh, redirect to a block page. Uh, HTTPS blocking is typically performed by looking at the plain text uh, field, like the server name indication field in the TLS header. Some common circumvention approaches include uh, using public DNS servers, uh, which deal with many forms of DNS censorship, the use of domain fronting to bypass HTTPS censorship, and the use of VPN services and Tor, Lantern, and, and similar uh, tools. And these circumvention approaches can be placed into two categories. Uh, one category is, is of relay-based uh, tools, like VPNs and Tor and Lantern, that rely on VPNs outside the circumvention censorship region to bypass censorship, 
And then there are local fixes which use the direct path uh, to bypass censorship. So the first thing we did was to conduct a case study of distributed censorship in Pakistan to understand what are the opportunities for improving circumvention performance. So our measurements were taken from different vantage points in Pakistan, uh, which included a university campus, which was served by two ISPs, ISP A and ISP B, and home users in Karachi served by ISP B only. So ISP A was blocking YouTube traffic, uh, was only blocking HTTP traffic, but was letting go HTTPS traffic. Uh, and ISP B was blocking both HTTP and HTTPS traffic, uh, and you could bypass that by using actually domain fronting. So the insights that we gathered about the sensors was that these, that blocking mechanisms used by sensors can actually differ across ISPs, and these blocking mechanisms can also differ, differ across URLs even within an ISP. And this is an observation which has been made in the past across different, different countries. Uh, for example, here is a plot of the fraction of different uh, blocking uh, mechanisms employed by I uh, ISPs in Yemen, Indonesia, Kyrgyzstan, Vietnam, and so on. Then we conducted measurements with different circumvention strategies. So here we fetched the ho YouTube homepage 200 times. Uh, this was via ISP B, which blocked both HTTP and HTTPS traffic. And here the local fix was to use domain fronting. So on the right hand side, you see a CDF of the page load times uh, for. Uh, di for static proxies located at different points across the world, including US, Germany, Netherlands, Japan. And the key takeaway is that all the static proxies exhibit longer PLTs than the, uh, than the local fix. Uh, next, we did conducted measurement with measurements with Tor. We picked Tor exits uh, at different locations across the world, including Canada, Czech Republic, Germany, Netherlands. Uh, and we find that the local fix in this case as well uh, leads to much smaller page load times. So the key takeaway is that different circumvention strategies impose widely different overheads. And measurements can reveal differences in blocking mechanisms which provide opportunities for picking the least circumvention, uh, the least overhead circumvention strategy. And this is the uh, key insight that we use in our design. So motivi motivated by these measurements, we set forth the following goals for our platform. The first is that the system should allow collection of uh, measurements from large number of users with their consent. Second, the system should allow adaptive circumvention so as to be able to minimize page load times. And in addition, a practical and usable measurement system should require no target list, which are either generally partially known or, or often tend to be inaccurate. Uh, as well as they should preserve the privacy of users contributing measurements. CISO meets these goals uh, by, by, uh, by doing uh, the following. So to achieve scalable measurements, it offers small page load times as an incentive. And to, to make it easy to uh, obtain user consent, it only measures those URLs that a user actually visits. And as a result, it does not require any target list. It achieves adaptive circumvention by measuring the precise blocking mechanism being used by the sensor and selects the least overhead circumvention strategy. CISO has two components. One is the CISO client, and the other is the measurement infrastructure. The CISO client runs a client-side proxy that is responsible for measuring censorship, reporting the uh, measurements about blocked URLs to the measurement infrastructure, and carrying out adaptive circumvention. The measurement infrastructure stores crowdsourced crowd measurements and periodically shares it with, with the clients. Zooming into C the CISO proxy, uh, it implements the measurement module which runs a, an inline censorship detection algorithm uh, to detect block pages with high accuracy and, and also deal with high censorship detection times. It makes use of redundant requests, one via the local fix and the other via the relay-based circumvention approach. And in order to achieve resilience to false reports that might be, uh, that might be uh, entered by the malicious users, CISO allows uh, randomly trying the direct path even if it's reported to be blocked by other users. Uh, it also hosts the circumvention module which, uh, which uh, implements different cir circumvention approaches. And here is the big picture of CISO. So you have CISO clients that are distributed 
uh, across the world. Uh, they visit websites according to their natural uh, browsing uh, habits. And when they find a web page to be blocked, they report this to the measurement infrastructure. So in this case, uh, a user found Y to be blocked in autonomous system B uh, using DNS blocking. And these measurements result in building up the measurement data, which is then used by individual clients to, 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 to speed up the circumvention. Uh, with any censorship measurement platform, you have to address important security and privacy considerations. So one challenge uh, with any crowdsourced um, uh, platform, and, and along with Seesaw, is interference with Seesaw measurements. So in Seesaw, uh, we mitigate uh, the impact of interference with measurements by retimicking the creation of fake IDs and using a voting mechanism. Uh, the sensors could also block access to the measurement infrastructure, and for that purpose, uh, Tor hidden services could also be leveraged. To achieve resilience to detection, all measurement reports are currently carried over the Tor network. We implemented Seesaw using the uh, GitHub's Electron framework, which makes it uh, usable with, uh, with, with many popular browsers and, and systems. It uh, measures common forms of censorship, implements several local fixes and optimizations, and supports Tor and Lantern as a relay-based circumvention approach. We evaluated, we conducted both macro benchmark experiments as well as micro benchmark experiments. Um, and here is uh, a plot of the, of, uh, of the page load times uh, for a DNS blocked web page uh, of, of Seesaw in comparison with Tor and Lantern. So as you can uh, see, Seesaw provides 2x improvement over, over Lan Lantern in the median and the median improvement over Tor was 3.2x. And Seesaw provides similar improvements uh, for unblocked pages because it measures the direct path by default, by default using redundant requests. We also deployed Seesaw and uh, we released this to 123 consenting users and, and collected measurements over a period of three months. This included residential, enterprise, and university network users in Pakistan. And the users were carefully informed about Seesaw but were not given any list of blocked websites they needed to visit. And some of the insights are as follows. Users visited 420 uh, web block domains accessed through 16 different autonomous systems. For majority of URLs, URLs a block page was returned followed by uh, DNS blocking. And uh, for the first time we found blocking of CDN, CDN servers in Pakistan which was not observed in prior measurement studies. During our deployment period, there were protests in Islamabad, the capital city of Pakistan, and as a reaction to that, the government blocked uh, many internet services, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and so on. And, and during this time, the Seesaw users visited these websites on their own and were able to measure these events in real time. So despite the benefits that Seesaw offers, it, it has limitations. So for example, for Seesaw, it's difficult to measure unpopular websites because it relies on the population of Seesaw users. And it's hard for Seesaw to actually do censorship at specific times because it does not allow measurement, uh, targeted measurements. Uh, we think this is an acceptable trade-off because it allows us, it makes it easy, easy for us to obtain user consent. Uh, the other uh, challenge with Seesaw is, is its reliance on Tor as one possible circumvention strategy. So while our hope is that Seesaw can ride the successes of blocking res resistance achieved by pluggable transports and bridges, uh, there is an arms race between Tor and some sensors like China. And it is useful to point out that not all countries are as resourceful or motivated as China uh, in this arms race. Uh, and more fundamentally, Seesaw does not rely on just one censor circumvention strategy. New circumvention strategies can be incorporated in, in its framework as they become available. And finally, uh, Seesaw does not deal with non-web filtering. So for example, filtering of WhatsApp or, or, or Skype. And in summary, Seesaw uh, uses crowdsourcing to collect measurements of censorship. And these measurements are then used uh, by Seesaw to provide adaptive circumvention, uh, which reduces page load times. And, and that, that's an incentive for users to opt in. So that's all I had. I'm open to questions.
Over there. Uh, Jeremy Epstein, National Science Foundation. Do you have any sense how much uh, uh, self-censoring you're not counting uh, because you're only getting the sites that people do visit, not the, th the ones they don't visit because they know or they suspect they're being censored or they uh, uh, think it might reflect badly on them to try to visit or something like that? So, so, so we are not measuring, uh, you know, what users are not, I mean, the, the websites that, they, that are not blocked. Uh, we're not reporting that in the measurement infrastructure because then you can easily build user profiles and, and, and de-anonymize users. So as of now, we just, uh, the users just report blocked websites. Right, I'm, I'm asking about the ones they don't even try to visit. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, for unpopular websites that, that users don't visit, we won't be able to measure them. Or popular sites that That's they don't correct. visit. That's correct, that's the limitation of CSOC. Uh, hi, uh, Ian Learmonth from Tor Project. Um, so I have a question about uh, the trade-offs between uh, plausible deniability and user safety with target lists and only using uh, URLs that a user has chosen to visit. Uh, so do you see that uh, because the user has explicitly chosen to visit a site and then the measurement attempts occurred and that can be logged, is that something you're concerned about? Uh, well, uh, there are you know, ethical concerns around uh, a user visiting a website and, and uh, but CSO tries to essentially navigate that by saying we're only going to measure websites that a user actually visits. We're not going to do any out of band measurements. We just look at the responses that a user gets uh, as it would do normally and based on that do the detection. Uh, so so that, that was something which, which we placed a really high premium on when we were designing this measurement infrastructure. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Oh, well. uh, Rob Sherwood, Facebook. Uh, very cool stuff. Um, the thing that occurs to me is like if this is super popular and you know becomes like a, a, a real force across, um, how do you start dealing with what's effectively malicious data being put into the system by the people trying to do the censorship? Right. So that's a, that's a great point. So this was one of the important things we accounted for in CISO. So. On the measurement infrastructure side, uh, we have mechanism, we have voting mechanisms to limit the impact that any single malicious client can do. And, and also rate limiting the fake creation of IDs. On the client side, what we do is we allow clients to measure blocked block websites that are reported to be blocked by other users uh, with, with a certain probability. And, that pr and, and the precise probability uh, uh, pr presents a trade-off between overhead and resilience to false reports. And so that needs to, so we also tested that, did a sensitivity analysis of that in, in, in the paper. Thank you. Hi, uh, Philippa Gill from UMass. Um, so if I understand correctly from your talk, this is mainly a web browser based tool? So this is a proxy that runs at the client side. Okay, so you're, are you able to get packet captures and see things like injected reset packets or, you know, injected DNS packets, that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, we are able to get that, yeah. So I have a, a quick question. So what are the implications of the user participating in your experiment? So uh, when we conducted these measurements in Pakistan, so these measurements were con conducted there, there were no implications of users accessing a, a, a certain censored website. But uh, in some countries that might be changing, so recently Egypt, I hear that has, has passed legislation where users might have implications for accessing certain censored research, and, and so informed user consent becomes important. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So our next speaker is Rachi Singh. Rachi is a third year PhD student at UMass Amherst, and she is advised by Philippa Gill. Uh, and she, her talk will be, oops, <laughs> her talk will be about uh, some work that she did with researchers at Microsoft. And one way to, I guess, describe the talk is, it's a nice example of what happens when networking meets optical communications. Okay, 
I hope I'm visible at the back. Okay, seems like it. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Rachi. Um, I'm a third year PhD student at UMass Amherst. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about inefficiencies in the way uh, we operate large optical backbones today. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with folks at Microsoft, University of Vienna, and UMass Amherst. Um, so here on the screen, I have a visualization of hundreds of data centers of a large cloud provider. These data centers are connected by a dedicated wide area network. And this, as you can imagine, this dedicated wide area network is critical to the kind of performance that the cloud provider promises its clients. Um, it's not just a critical resource to the performance, it's also an extremely expensive resource. So it takes roughly hundreds of millions of dollars each year to maintain and operate uh, a wide area backbone of this scale. Um, as a result of their importance and their cost, there's been a lot of work that's come from both industry and academia that focuses on utilizing this wide area network better. We want to use it efficiently, we want to uh, reduce the costs of operating this network and so on. And we've seen this work come up um, in the last few years at SICOM. What, however, has not been looked at as this is this underlying optical topology that makes this wide area network possible. Um, this optical topology that consists of 100,000 miles of fiber, thousands of optical devices that connect switches and routers to the fiber. And as you can imagine, fiber is an expensive resource. It's scarce. It often requires manual effort to lay this fiber down. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to tell you that in spite of its importance and cost, this optical layer is very inefficient. And I'm going to tell you how can we fix these inefficiencies to gain both, both network capacity and availability. At the end of this talk, um, I hope to tell you the potential to gain 134 terabits of capacity in a large North American backbone while preventing 25% of failures uh, that happen currently. Uh, with this, I want to quickly give you the overview of what this talk is going to be about. So first, I'm going to quantify for you how, e how exactly how inefficient these backbones are. I'm then going to tell you what our proposal for fixing these inefficiencies is, what are the challenges we face in implementing these proposals in production wide area networks, and I'm going to end with a description and evaluation of our system um, and our proposal, which is rate adaptive wide area networks. So getting into the first thing, which is how inefficient are these optical backbones? To answer this question, I'm going to zoom into the North American part of this large, American backbone, uh, large North American backbone network. Um, you can see that these yellow lines on the, on the map, these are the fiber deployments. And on top of these lines, I have these devices which are called optical cross connects. The job of these optical cross connects is to connect the layer three switches and routers to the underlying fiber and switch optical signals. So I'm going to zoom into one of these pairs of optical cross connects. Uh, and you can see there's a fiber that runs between them. Um, on each fiber path, there's a number of wavelengths of light that traverse it. A measure of the quality of signal on these fiber paths is this thing called the signal to noise ratio, which is basically, uh, which basically says if, if the SNR is high for these wavelengths, I can, um, this, it's good for me. I can push more packets on this wavelength. Um, so what we do is at each of these optical cross connects, we measure signal quality. We do this for 8,000 wavelengths in this North American backbone. We do it every 15 minutes, and we've been doing it for the last two and a half years. So using this data, I'm going to give you a preview into what does a longitudinal view of the signal quality on fiber look like. So before I do that, here on the x-axis, I'm showing you time, which is roughly two and a half years. Y-axis is uh, signal quality measured in SNR. And again, to reiterate the point, higher is better, lower is worse. And this is what the signal quality of a single wavelength on one fiber in this backbone looks like. This green line that I just showed you, this basically says this is the static threshold in state-of-the-art networks for driving 100 gigs of traffic on this wavelength of light. So basically what this means is that currently, if the SNR of a link is above 6.5, the link is up, I can push 100 gigs of traffic on it. However, if it's below 6.5, the link is down, and I cannot, it's, it's incapable of carrying any traffic. 
Given we know this, I want to direct your attention towards a few key things here. The first is that even though we are looking at two and a half years of data, SNR looks fairly stable here, right? However, once in a while we see these dips, you can, you can see these sharp drops in signal quality, uh, and these correspond to link failures when the drop in SNR is below 6.5. The most important thing that I want you to look at, though, is this green region. This green region that shows the large difference between the minimum SNR I require to push 100 gigs of traffic on this link versus what the actual SNR that the, that the fiber actually has. So this is the difference between 6.5 and roughly 13 units uh, of SNR. This region represents massive untapped opportunity in terms of capacity from this particular, particular link. To illustrate this point, I'm going to show you if I needed, if I wanted to drive this link at 175 gigs per second, the signal quality is actually good enough to sustain that for almost this entire duration uh, of two and a half years. So this sort of says that we've, we've left some capacity on the table by operating with these static conservative thresholds. The last thing I want to point out about this graph is this particular dip that's highlighted in red. You can see that as the SNR dipped below 6.5, the link was down, we would call it a failure at higher layers of protocol. Um, but the important thing to notice here is that even at that failure point, the SNR was above 2.5 dB, which is the threshold for driving this link at 50 gigabits of capacity. So not only do we have potential to gain capacity, we also have potential to gain availability here. But this is one wavelength, and you might think, does this scale to the entire backbone? So I'm going to show you what is the opportunity of, of capacity gain at scale. So for these 8,000 wavelengths, I'm plotting here on this graph the average SNR on the x-axis and a distribution on the y-axis. As so here is the threshold for uh, if I want to drive this link at 100 gigs of capacity. You will notice that 95% of wavelengths that I analyzed operate at, operate at, can operate at 100 gigs or higher, which is great. More importantly, though, these thresholds represent how much minimum SNR do I need to drive these links at higher capacities. And this is the striking fact here, which is 64% of these wavelengths can operate at 175 gigs or higher, but we've only been using them for a conservative 100 gigs. Now I'm going to look at what is the opportunity for availability gain. So I'm plotting here on the x-axis the SNR at all failure events that I've observed in the last two and a half years, and y-axis is the cumulative distribution. I want you to note this green region, which covers roughly 25% of this distribution. So that this means that for 25% of failures that we've observed in the last two and a half years, the failure SNR was above 2.5 dB, meaning these failures could have been prevented if I had the capability of reducing the link's capacity to 50 gigabits per second. So I think at this point I've made a case that we are leaving a lot of capacity and availability on the table by operating with these static thresholds. So here's our proposal. We propose that we want to dynamically adapt link capacities in response to changes in SNR. So we, we want to adapt the link capacities of physical links here uh, as the SNR in, these, in the fiber changes. This leads to two, go two gains. The first is that we stand to gain up to 134 terabits of capacity if we increase link capacities when the SNR is high. The second is that we stand to prevent 25% of failures if we can reduce link capacity when the SNR is low. This is our proposal. I'm going to go back to my outline and tell you what, what are we going to discuss next. So if I had to implement dynamic capacity links in a production-wide area network, what sort of challenges would I face? And that's the subject of the next part of this talk. I'm going to look at challenges in dynamically adapting link capacity in production networks. There are two key challenges that we focus on. The first is that I need some form of hardware support to change, to be able to inform physical links that, the, that I want to adapt their capacities. And the second is I want to rethink, I need to rethink how traffic engineering is done currently because traffic engineering is one of the consumers of available link capacities in the network. Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to give you some intuition about why these challenges are important and how do we solve them. The first challenge is, what sort of hardware support do I need? So we ask ourselves, can I use commodity hardware, hardware that's already out there in the market, and use it for adapting link capacities in today's network? 
Uh, we asked ourselves this question and we found that there are these devices called bandwidth variable transceivers or BVTs that are currently available. Uh, what these devices do as of now is that they plug into the line cards of switches. So here I have a photograph of a switch from our lab. Uh, these are two line cards in the switch and you can see the BVTs, the BVT modules are plugged into them in this, in this way. And the job of these BVTs is to provide us with options in how we can modulate uh, the signal that comes from them. These different discrete signals, uh, these diff uh, discrete modulations that we're allowed, QPSK, 8QAM, and 16QAM, correspond to 100 gig, 150 gig, and 200 gig of port capacity. So it seems like this might work. Uh, we wanted to test what does this mean for dynamically adapting link capacities. For this, we did a small experiment. Uh, I'm again showing you here on the left side of the screen an Arista 7504 modular chassis. Um, I've plugged in two, mo uh, two BVTs into the line cards here and they correspond to those ports you can see. Uh, I make a fiber connection between these ports to this device called a variable optical attenuator or a VOA. The job of a VOA is to attenuate the signal that's traversing this fiber. Um, it does this by adding noise to the signal. So the, the reason that I'm doing this is that I want to figure out that if we add noise to the signal, what can we do with commodity hardware by using these BVDs? So from left to right, I'm going to increase noise from the attenuator. I've written a small controller that reacts to changes on this switch uh, when this noise gets added. So just to reiterate the purpose here, we want to see how can we use commodity hardware for dynamically adapting link capacities. So again, I'm increasing noise from left to right. The port currently can carry 200 gigs of traffic. On the x-axis, I have time, and on the y-axis, there's SNR and dB. As you can see, initially, the SNR is quite high. This, this is the SNR that I'm measuring at the port on the switch. The SNR is quite high, we are doing well, we are adding noise, and the SNR is degrading. Eventually, the switch is like, hey, I can't deal with these errors, this is too much, I'm gonna turn the link down. In that span where the SNR is showing up as zero, the port's down, it cannot carry any traffic. At this point, our controller kicks in, and it says, I'm gonna downgrade the capacity of this port from 200G to 150G. And the link is down while this is happening. Again, we keep adding noise from the VOA, and eventually, the switch again says, I can't deal with, the, with, the, with these many errors, I'm gonna turn the port down. Again, our controller kicks in, downgrades the capacity to 100 gig, and we are able to get the port back up. The key factor here is that it took, is, is, is those red regions. If you look at those uh, red regions I've highlighted in the graph, they show that when we uh, start to change the capacity of ports on this switch, it takes roughly a minute for the capacity change to take effect. And this leads to the key problem that we solve in this paper, which is commodity hardware is not optimized for dynamically adapting link capacities. This is because even though this hardware has been out there uh, so far, it's been used in a manner that it's deployed once, the modulation format is set at that time, and then we forget about it. Um, so we ask ourselves, what is the cause of this latency in capacity reconfiguration? and I'm going to show you the process in which capacity reconfig happens. So here on this axis, I'm representing time, and I initially start with that port that I was showing you on the switch that's usable, so I can push traffic on this port. When I decide to initiate the process of modulation change, the first thing that the BVT does is that it turns the laser off. As soon as the laser is turned off, the link is not usable, it cannot carry any traffic anymore. It then goes ahead and programs the registers, saying I want to change the modulation format, it turns the laser back on, and it takes that long for the laser to come back up, and then the link is usable again. Notice that it took roughly a minute just for this process of turning the laser off and turning it back on. So we conclude that majority of time is spent in doing this process. So a natural question here is, can we reduce the outages we int introduce in this link while changing capacities by just not turning the laser off. So can I skip this step and see what happens? To do this, we, we, we got access to this evaluation board, which is basically the same bandwidth variable transceiver module I showed you earlier, just that it allows us to program it via an API. So this is the evaluation board. I do this simple experiment. 
where I program registers for modulation change. I skip the step of turning the laser off. So now since I can program this, I can do this uh, by hand, so I just don't do this. I repeat the experiment, and we find that if the laser is left on, the process of changing a quartz capacity only takes 35 milliseconds on average. So this shows that there is hope for us to get to a hitless capacity reconfiguration world, but it only takes on the order of milliseconds to change a link's capacity dynamically. But we do agree that it takes, this might take some amount of engineering effort to, to, to actually implement. So our system design assumes that it does take a minute or so to change a link's uh, capacity at this point. So far, I've dealt with the, the hardware challenge that we faced, and I'm, I'm now going to tell you about the second challenge, which is about traffic engineering, and how should traffic engineering deal with links that can dynamically adapt their capacity. Um, there are two reasons why traffic engineering needs to change in the dynamic capacity landscape. The first is inspired from the hardware challenge I just spoke about. If capacity changes cause links to be unavailable for carrying traffic, TE needs to be aware of this. The second reason why traffic engineering needs to be redone is it leads to network churn every time we turn a link off to adapt its capacity and then bring it back up. So these are the two key challenges that TE needs to think of while it assigns flows in the network in the presence of dynamic capacity links. Um, and this brings me to the final part of the talk where I'm going to describe to you how we solve these challenges uh, with rate adaptive wide area networks. Um, so our solution to these two challenges is designing this traffic engineering controller called the RADVAN or Rate Adaptive Wide Area Network Controller. There are three key properties of the RADVAN controller that I want to uh, mention. The first is that the RADVAN controller is SNR aware. So it's aware of the possible gain in capacity each link in the network can have depending on the properties of the physical layer. It's rate adaptive. So if there are demands in the network that cannot, be met, uh, that cannot be met with the current configuration, the RADVAN controller can adapt link capacities, uh, increase link capacities, in fact, to meet these demands. It can also reduce link capacities if the SNR drops below a threshold in order to improve availability. And finally, the RADVAN controller is minimally disruptive, which means that we know that reconfiguring a link's capacity leads to a one-minute outage for that link. So we want to adapt capacities in such a manner that we are not introducing too much churn in the network. The formulation of RADVAN is in the paper, so I'm not going to go into the mathy details of it, but I'm going to give you an intuition for what it looks like. For any traffic engineering system, we have a set of inputs. There are a set of outputs. And at the core of this traffic engineering controller is an optimization objective. The objective can be I want to maximize the throughput in the network, I want to minimize the cost of this network, and so on. This optimization objective is subject to a number of constraints. These constraints can be in the form of flow conservation, in terms of link capacity bounds, and so on. So then the traffic engineering, so everything now that I'm, I'm telling you is stuff that traffic engineering controllers already do. So they take as input the network topology, which is like who's which data center is connected to whom, what MPLS tunnels do I have available in the network, and so on. It also takes as input the demand matrix, which is between a source and destination data center, how much flow needs to be routed. And then these go as an input to the optimization objective and outcome the flow allocation, which is basically how much flow needs to be routed along which MPLS tunnel in the network. In addition to doing these things, the RADVAN TE controller also takes as input the optical topology and SNR. So it's aware of what signal quality which link has. Additionally, it takes as input the current flow allocations in the network. And if you think about it, this last input, which is about current flow allocations, is the key important thing that we need to take into account if we want to dynamically adapt link capacities. Because the flow allocation that links currently have are the ones that will get disrupted if we decide to upgrade a link's capacity. We feed these to the optimization objective. And in, in addition to getting flow allocations, we also get which links do I need to reconfigure in order to meet these traffic demands. Uh, again, details of this formulation are in the paper. Please feel, feel free to check them out. So we implement this controller, and we do two types of evaluation. The first is a small-scale evaluation, but in a realistic setting. So uh, we, we, we built a proof of concept, concept uh, wide area network. 
uh, which consists of four data centers connected by fiber of that scale. So the, the, the distances between the cities are reflecting the scale of this wide area network that we built. The logical topology is uh, something like this. We have four routers, A, B, C, and D. They are connected by roughly 1,500 kilometers or 1,000 miles of fiber. Uh, and at each 60 to 80 uh, kilometer distance, there's an amplifier that's, that's connected, and that's the standard setting. At every 60 to 80 kilometers, even in the wild, we need to connect an amplifier. This topology, in reality, in the test bed, looks something like this. There's one Arista 7504 modular chassis split uh, into logical routers with VRFs. There are 16 amplifiers, um, and there are, there's a, there are schools and schools of fiber that are hidden from view. Um, we evaluate the performance of uh, a toy traffic uh, demand on this topology. I'm not going to show you the results of that, but I'm going to show you the results of a large-scale evaluation of the RAD band beam controller. So I'm going to evaluate what throughput gains can I get if I do, if I dynamically adapt link capacities in a setting where I have the real network topology, uh, I have real SNR coming in from links, and I'm using a cyclical traffic demand uh, that, that folks might be aware of from previous work. Um, on the x-axis, I have time, and on the y-axis, I'm plotting network throughput uh, in GBPS. And this network throughput is the optimal throughput that different traffic engineering schemes achieve when they try to meet this demand. So the first line here is how SWAN, which is a state-of-the-art traffic engineering system, uh, it performs in, in the presence of this uh, signal quality and traffic demand. You can see it's, it's, it's roughly around uh, 5,000 GBPS, and you can see that there's a, there's a sawtooth pattern there, which is because the demand is cyclic in nature. Now, if I push the static threshold of link capacities to 150 gigs in place of 100 gigs, uh, which basically means that now I'm operating all links in my network at 156, at, at 150 gigs because the signal quality is that good. What can SWAN do in that setting? So it achieves slightly higher throughput. This is SWAN with 150 gigs of capacity on each link. Again, using realistic, uh, using the real measurements of SNR and real network topology. This is what RADVAN does. Um, it performs 40% better than state-of-the-art SWAN controller. Uh, in terms of optimal throughput achieved. Um, you'll notice these dips in the, in the throughput that RADVAN achieves. These are instances when the controller decides that the demand is high enough that it needs to upgrade the capacity of a number of links in the network. And when this happens, the throughput drops because if you remember, there's a one minute span for which this link is going to be out while the capacity reconfiguration happens. Now, you, you, you might also recall that hitless capacity reconfiguration is something we might have in the next few years, given enough engineering effort. So if I had the capacity of doing RADVAN hitless, uh, that's how good I can do in this setting. And you can see those dips that we saw are no longer there, because now capacity change is essentially hitless. Um, with this, I want to conclude. Uh, we, the, the key takeaways I want you to remember here is that physical layer today is configured statically. Um, in this work, we show that this is inefficient in terms of uh, capacity, availability, and even equipment cost, details of which are there in the paper. Uh, I, in, I presented to you RADVAN, which introduces programmability in layer one. Uh, it does, when it does so, it improves throughput by 40%, reduces link downtime on average by a factor of 18, and it reduces equipment cost measured in dollar per gigabits per second by 32%. Thank you. With that, I'll take any questions. Sanjay from Purdue, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Um, I have a somewhat possibly naive question. What if you don't um, change the capacity, just set it to the maximum, say 200, but let the traffic engineering pump in only so much as is permitted? So, so let's say you really should operate at 100. You set it at 200 all the time, but let traffic engineering only send 100. The benefit, um, the problem with that is if you set every link to 200 gigs and you're like, I'm set and I'll only send 100 gigs, the problem is when the SNR falls below the threshold for 200, which is quite high, it's like 13 dB uh, in, in this network that we, sh we showed you, 
um, the link is going to go down no matter what. It's sort of like a failure, how we see failures in a binary sense now, but it's just going to be like at a higher capacity. And because we are operating much closer to the actual SNR, there's a higher probability of failing in that case compared to now. So these conservative thresholds have, have been set in such a manner that we don't fail often. Uh, but if you're operating that high and that close, uh, there's, a, there's a very strong chance we fail often. And in which case, if it's not a hitless capacity reconfiguration, there's a one minute downtime that there is no way you can avoid. I see. And uh, is it easy to map from sig SNR to bandwidth? Is that a very easy mapping? There is a formula that, uh, gi given a setting of uh, amplifiers and equ equipment in the network, there's a, there's a formula that, uh, that can give you how much minimum SNR do you need uh, to, to get this capacity. Okay, thank you. Uh, Abdul from ETH Zurich. Uh, so I didn't get that part. When you tried a kit at the lab uh, and you didn't uh, turn on and off, uh, you know, uh, the link and nothing happened after you tried it 2,000 times or something. So why is the default setting enforcing this one minute penalty? Um, there's, a, there's a number of things that the device, so we had conversations with both Arista and Acacia, the folks who manufacture the switch and the folks who manufacture the BVT about uh, being able to do this with the evaluation board and um, wondering why can we just not do this in the production setting as well. Uh, the, the primary concern that they have is for the health of the BBT module. They think that if we don't turn the laser off, uh, the changes that happen in the process of modulation change would hurt the device. We are yet to evaluate this claim because from the, the optics know-how we, ha we, we have and we've asked around, we don't think uh, the health of the device should be in question. Uh, but that's, that's their primary concern probably because they have to provide uh, some form of support for these devices and they don't want to deal with uh, situations they haven't tested for. Um, Rob Sherwood, Facebook, very cool work. Um, have you thought at all about, so I, I'm, I'm hung up about trying to get this work to the existing devices. Have you thought about kind of using more CWDM to get kind of more lanes or more, more lambdas that are smaller so that when this, the SNR goes down, instead of losing 200 gigabit of capacity or 100 gigabit, or maybe you only lose 25, and, but you have four, four different lambdas there. See? No, that's, that's, that's a good question, and that's not something we've, uh, we've looked at, because that's, I, didn't, I do not know how common CWM is. Uh, CWDM. C CWDM so, is. so it's a question of whether you have the, the, the boxes in line, but at least on the Arista side, you can certainly break out the, the, the lines that way. So okay. like the Arista side supports this question where your optical infrastructure doesn't. That so would when, be very when, you say, cool. when you say optical infrastructure, do you mean the transceiver module? Um, no, what I mean is you know, somewhere you have something that is taking you know, what is effectively many ports and putting it onto one fiber. It's those right. different wavelengths that you're talking right. about. Right. And you know, the device that's doing that. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that's not a setting I've tested in, but let's talk offline and okay. discuss if we can do that. This is good work. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Arseni, UPFL, thank you for the talk. I enjoyed it. Uh, I have a quick question about the, the, this plot on the slide seven about uh, the, this 100 uh, G threshold. I wonder why, like given the link that uh, the actual SNR was uh, almost twice uh, higher than, than the threshold, why was it uh, set so low? Um, that there's many reasons. The, the most important one is if you look at the dips that have happened, there's a number of dips towards the end which were significant in terms of drop in SNR, but they were not significant enough for it to be a layer three link failure, right? Because the SNR remained above 6.5. So if I had to be the one who has to wake up every time a link fails, I would try to be as conservative as I can. Um, I think that was primarily uh, being conservative to avoid frequent failures was sort of the approach uh, that operators took at some point, and that's the reason why the threshold is so far below from what the actual signal quality is. Thank you. Jenna Iyengar, Fastly. Um, excellent work and, 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 and a really, really good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the one thing I missed, and I, I don't know if I missed it, but uh, it doesn't seem like you probed up. Um, you, you, you collapse the capacity when SNR collapses, but uh, have, you, have you considered how you might probe and how you might actually reclaim that capacity when SNR goes back up and what are the potential side effects of doing that? 
Great. So um, if you look at that extended period, sort of in the middle right, little right of the middle, uh, the SNR goes down, um, and then it comes back up. Uh, and that span is, of, is roughly months, a uh, few months. So in that setting, yes, the, t the, the RADVAN controller, when the SNR drops, would adapt the capacity to a lower value. But when the SNR does come up, um, it would not immediately change the capacity to 200 gigs, for instance, because there's, unless and until there is uh, traffic demand that needs that capacity to be upgraded. So the, the, the key idea is that we only, only do a capacity reconfiguration on the higher end if we absolutely need to, because we want to avoid these outages. On the other hand, when SNR falls, we really don't have a choice. It's like we have to downgrade the capacity because we want to keep uh, critical traffic flowing. So when you say you absolutely need to, you mean that there is no capacity in the network and therefore you probe this to find out if there's more available here? Right, no, no, that's not what I mean. I mean okay. that if the SNR of a particular link, of a given link in the network, falls below the threshold of the capacity I'm operating this link at, uh, I need to downgrade the capacity because there's, yes. the switch can't handle that many errors, even with forward error correction. So in that case, I'll have to downgrade the capacity, yes. and that would take the link out for a minute, but I do it because I want to keep that connectivity in place. There is no choice. If I don't do anything, the link's going to go down indef indefinitely. If I downgrade the capacity, the link's going to go down for a minute and then be back up at a lower uh, capacity value. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll continue this question offline because I think there's something that I'm trying to get at. But sure. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Again. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rachi. Thank you. Okay. So our next speaker is uh, uh, Tom Yang. Tom Young is from uh, Department of uh, Computer Science at Beijing University. He received his PhD from Shanghai University, and he's interested in areas like streaming data and probabilistic data structures like hash tables and such, and sketches. So this particular talk is about a particular type of sketch construction that's adaptive to network conditions. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Tong Yang from Peking, Peking University. Today, my topic is Elastic Sketch, Adaptive and Fast Network Wide Measurements. And uh, here is the answer list. And Jie Jiang, Peng Liu, Jun Zhu Gong, Yang Zhu are my students. Huang Qin is from ICTCS. Biao Rui from Alibaba. Xia Ming Li from Peking University. Steve Yunig from Queen Mary. And uh, this is the outline. First, we introduce the background. Network management is important because it provides important information for network applications. And the best solution is to use Sketch. Sketch is a compact data structure. It is memory efficient. It can achieve constant speed and high accuracy. Most of our existing solutions focus on a good trade-off among the three following dimensions. Memory usage, speed, and accuracy. A recent work, Unimon, pays attention to another dimension generality. It wants to use only one sketch to process many tasks. In addition to the above four dimensions, this paper pays attention to another two aspects. Adaptive to traffic characteristics and cross-platform. Network measurements are especially important when there are problems in networks, such as network congestion, network scans, and, and DDoS attack. Uh, in these cases, uh, traffic characteristics will vary a lot. Traffic characteristics include the available bandwidth, flow size distribution, and uh, packet arrival rate. The first characteristic is the bandwidth. In data centers, administrators often care more about the state of the whole network rather than the state of a single link or a node. 
and this is known as network-wide management. For this, they often deploy many management nodes in the data centers, which periodically send the sketches to the collector. However, network, uh, however, network congestion is common, and therefore the available bandwidth is unstable. To address this problem, a new solution is to build many sketches with different sizes and send the sketch with the appropriate size according to the current available bandwidth. And in contrast, our solution is to actively compress the sketch according to the current, currently available bandwidth. And uh, at the same time, we want to achieve high accuracy. This is the first work to compress sketches. The second characteristic is the packet rate. It is variable and could, uh, and, and could vary drastically. As existing, uh, existing sketches can achieve constant speed, uh, but will drop packets when the packet rate is very high. Our goal is to minimize the number of accesses to one and minimize the number of hash computations to one. The third characteristic is flow size distribution. As a no to all network, network traffic is skewed. It means that most of flow are very small. They have only maybe one or two packets. Um, there are no MS flows. And a very small number of flows are very large. They are known as elephant flows. If we can separate elephant flows from mouse flows, we can use large counters for elephant flows, and we can use small counters for mass flows. And we can also use different data structures for elephant flows and mass flows. And our goal is to achieve accurate separation and dynamically allocate memory for elephant flows and mass flows. And uh, existing solutions are designed for uh, specific uh, platforms, such as CPU. And uh, OpenSketch is designed for NetIPG. Unimon is designed for people switch. And uh, our goal is to enable our sketch to support the following six platforms. People switch, IPG, GPU, OS, CPU, and Matical. And this is a typical measurement tasks and the corresponding sketch algorithms. There are, we, there are actually there are more algorithms. Here, here we only introduce the most widely used one, the same sketch. Actually, it's, it is similar to counting blue filters. Suppose we have many packets. Here, each atom is a packet, and each color is a flow. For example, the blue flow has two packets, and the green flow has three packets. And we want to know how many packets in each flow. So we first insert the blue packets. We calculate four hash functions and get four counters. We just increment all the four counters by one. This is the insertion. It is simple and fast. Then how to query the free the, how to query the frequency or we see the size of the blue flow. We compute the same four hash functions and we get four counters. And uh, in this case, we only report the smallest counter. Note that the smallest counter is always larger than or equal to than the true size of the blue flow. This is known as one set error or we see overestimation error. Next, we show our elastic sketch from the following seven aspects. First, rationale. Our goal is to separate, one of our goal is to separate elephant flow from, from mass flows. Our key technique is called uh, archicism. It works for elephant flow. Archicism was a procedure in ancient essence. And uh, in this rule, any citizen can be voted to be evicted from Ison for 10 years. Our algorithm is similar to this procedure. 
uh, let's consider a simple, uh, simple problem. Suppose we have many packets where, uh, with uh, they are belong to several flows and we want to use only one bucket uh, to choose the largest flow. It is hard and you cannot uh, always do it right. Our method is that we use three fields. The first field is a flow ID, second field is a positive votes, second, uh, and the third field is a negative votes. When the negative votes is much larger than the positive votes, we will evict this flow in the bucket. Then we use, uh, several, then we use several examples to show how our basic version works. We have two parts, a heavy part and a light part. The heavy part is for elephant flow and the mass part and the light part for mass flow. The heavy part is a hash table. It has many buckets. In each bucket, we have four fields. The flow ID, positive votes, and the negative votes. The flag is used to indicate whether there are evictions in the bucket. Okay, we then show four example. First, a flow F1 comes. It is mapped to the first bucket. They have the same flow ID. Therefore, we just increment the positive votes. Second, um, F5 is mapped to, the, to an empty bucket. We just insert F5 into this bucket. And the flag is to start to false because currently there is no eviction. And the third example is that F8 is mapped to a full bucket. F, F5, uh, F8. F8 is different from F3. Therefore, we increment the negative votes from 11 to 12. However, 12 is not large enough. Therefore, we insert F8 to the light part. It is a same sketch. We just uh, increment the two corresponding counter by one. Last example, F9 is hashed to the last bucket. And we first uh, increment the negative votes from 55 to 56. In this case, 56 is just equal to seven. Seven is a positive votes times lambda. Lambda here is set to eight. In this case, F4 is evicted by F9. And F4 is inserted to the light part. And the two corresponding counter will be incremented by seven because seven is a positive vote. Okay, this is a basic version. And uh, we can see for elephant flows, they have very large number of positive votes. Therefore, with high probability, they will stay in the heavy part. For mass flows, uh, even if they are lucky to be inserted to the heavy part, they will be evicted, they will be evicted soon to the light part because they have only a very few number of positive votes. And uh, we can, uh, and, and for a bucket in the heavy part, we can see that if the, if the flag is false, the frequency, the flow size has no error. If the flag is true, we need to query the light part. The error is uh, the, the, uh, the error is incurred by the mass flow in the latter part. Because the error is incurred by mass flows, therefore the error is very small. And uh, this is a query process. We first query the heavy part, then the light part. Um, more details can be found in our paper. And uh, this is a formula for error bound. The error bound is much tighter than that of the same sketch. The worst case is elephant collision. It means that more than one elephant flow are mapped to one counter. And the clean rate can be calculated by this formula. Obviously, and obviously the clean rate should be as small as possible. Later, we will show several methods to minimize the clean rate. Before that, we show how our basic version be adaptive to the traffic characteristics. First, 
so adapted to the available bandwidth, we compress the light part because the light part is relatively large. And there are three key operations. First, how to group counters, then how to merge counters, and third, how to change the hash functions. And we use an example to show our compression algorithm. Suppose we have the sketch, we have the same sketch with width of nine, and we want to compress the width to three. There are three steps. First, we split the sketch into three divisions equally. And the second, we build a sketch B with width of three. Third, we group counters. All the counters with the same index are regarded as in one group. And we will compress all counters in one group to one counter. Uh, for example, these three counters are in the same group. And uh, we, can we need to compress them into one counter. There are two strategies. We can use uh, some value. We can add them all. And uh, we can also use uh, max value. For same sketch, if we use a max value, the accuracy can be much higher. And uh, then how the hash functions changes? We give two simple example. 10 module six, then module three is equal to 10 module three. Another example, 10 module eight, then module four is equal to 10 module four. Therefore, the hash function is changed from H module nine to H module nine, then module three, it is equal to H module three. Therefore, it means that uh, we do not need any additional data structure for the compression. We do not need a decompression. And uh, after compression, the sketch is still has one set error, only overestimate, over, only overestimate error. And uh, we can use the similar method to match to merge two sketches. Suppose we have two sketch, sketch A and sketch B. They have the same size and they have the same hash functions. Then how to merge them? First, we also group counters. Suppose these two counters are in the same group. And uh, we can also use the uh, max value or the sum value. If we use the max value, the accuracy can be much higher. The second signal we show how to adapt to high packet rate, recalling that our data structure, our data structures have two parts, a heavy part and a light part. When the packet rate is very high, we only access the heavy part. And uh, the insertion operation is to modify it as follows. Then how, uh, then how can we adapt to flow size distribution? When the number of elephant flows increase a lot, we need to allocate me more memory for elephant flows. And uh, the key operation is called a copy. Then we use an example to show how copy operation works. Suppose this is the original heavy part. It has four packets. We just copy it. Then we have a copy part. After copy operation, the hash function is changed from H module four to H module eight. Then each flow has a redundant copy in the in uh, in all the packets. One straightforward solution is to scan all the packets and uh, eliminate all redundant copies. We propose a lazy elimination. For example, we want to insert the flow F two it is mapped to the third bucket. Then we check whether F3 should be in the bucket. We just uh, calculated the hash function, module eight, not module four. And we found the remainder is six rather than four. Therefore, F3 is a redundant cell. It is re Therefore, we delete it and uh, insert F2 here. Next, uh, we show how, how to minimize the elephant clean rate for different uh, platform, for software, hardware, people switch, and multi-core platforms. First, for software version, 
we use one factor to store multiple flows. That's the factor is larger. And uh, all the flows in the factor share only one negative votes. And uh, we only, if a factor is mapped, we always try to evict the smallest uh, flow. Uh, in this way, the larger flow will be safe and the accuracy will be high. And uh, for the light part, uh, we only use one array. Actually, if you use two, uh, two arrays, the accuracy can be higher. But uh, we want to be faster, we want to be simple. And uh, one array is accurate enough. And uh, second, uh, we, uh, we designed uh, for hardware version. We use several subtables in the heavy part. And in this case, uh, each flow will have several candidate buckets and the clean rate will drop significantly. And for all the subtables, they have same operations. The only difference is the hash function. Therefore, this is suitable for hardware pipeline. And based on the hardware version, we propose the people switch version. There are some differences. We only show the key difference. For each stage, or we say each sub table in the, uh, in the hardware version, we split it into two stages. The, the first stage is to store the number of all votes, and the second stage is to store the flow ID and the positive votes. Mm, this is a little complicated. More details can be found uh, in our technical report. And the last version is called the multi core version. For each CPU call, we create a thread. For each thread, we build a sketch. When all the sketch are built completely, we merge all the sketches into one. For the light part, we can also use the max value to achieve high accuracy. Then we uh, use our sketch to process the following six measurement tasks. Flow size, heavy heat, heavy change, distribution, entropy, and uh, cardinality. And uh, we implemented uh, our sketch on the following six platforms. People switch, IPG, GPU, CPU, multi-core, and OS. Then here are the experimental results. We use a trace from CADA, and the flow ID is a source IP address. We evaluated the matrix of relative error, absolute error, throughput, and so on. And we compare our exam with the state of art exam for each of the six measurement tasks. Um, for the memory usage and the bandwidth usage, we found that our elastic sketch can significantly reduce the memory usage and the bandwidth usage. And uh, for the packed rate, when the packed rate is higher, existing, uh, existing sketches will lose packets, while other sketch do not lose packets. And uh, when the packet rate is extremely high, we also lose packets. And the accuracy, our accuracy is much higher than other sketches during this process. Then we show the results for flow size distribution. When we use the copy operation, the accuracy only, decre uh, only decreased a little. This is the results for processing speed on CPU platforms. Uh, Elastic achieves the fastest speed, followed by MRAC and RC. MIC can be only used for estimating the flow size distribution, and RC can only be used for estimating the number of flows, also known as cardinality, where our, where our sketch can process all the six measurement tasks. And this is results for throughput on CPU, GPU, multi-core, P4, and FPG platforms. We can see that people switch can achieve much higher throughput than other platforms. For the throughput on OS, we found that when using our Elastic Sketch, the throughput almost does not change. 
This is a result summary. Compared to the state art Unimon, the speed improvements is between 44 and 40%, and the accuracy improvement is between 2 and 200 times. Finally, we get to the conclusion. Uh, we propose a generic framework named Elastic Sketch. It is elastic, generic, fast, and accurate. It is adaptive to traffic characteristics. It is one sketch for six measurement tasks. And the key technique is called uh, artism and uh, compression. Uh, we implement our sketch on six platforms. People switch IPG, GPU, CPU, multi-core, and, and OS. And all the source codes are available at GitHub. And that's all. Thank you. Well, let's start from Huawei. First of all, thank you. It's very interesting. I wonder how do you reconstruct the original keys? How do you what Rec the how do you know the original keys? You have elasticity, hash tables, the entry is moving. So how do you reconstruct the original key? Oh, the okay. five tuple. Okay, yes. Yes, this is a very good question. And uh, for the key, you mean the flow ID? Yes. Yeah, the flow yes. ID, yes. the five tuple. Yes. yes. The, the, um, and the, for the flow ID, uh, we can go to the slides. Uh, okay. For the flow ID. And, uh, for the flow ID, we only keep the flow ID of the elephant flow. We do not keep the flow ID of mass flow. Because uh, this uh, six measurement task, uh, they do not need the flow ID. And uh, if we need but the flow ID. But let's need the flow so distribution or whatever, then uh, yeah, I would yeah. interest it also to know how many mice and, how, and uh, what is the size of the mice. There are not only two packets always, right? Yes. So, so if, if, the, if we, okay, let's see. Yes, yes, uh, yes, that, that's, uh, that's indeed a problem. Uh, because I talked with many guys in the industry, and uh, they use flow cache. And the flow cache can maintain the recent flow IDs. And, uh, no, the reversible cache, for example, try to answer it by using some special uh, hash functions, right? Yes, yes. Actually, if we want to keep the flow ID, we can use some hash tables. When the frequency size is, uh, um, is, uh, 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 is larger than a square foot, we can just keep the flow, uh, okay. flow ID. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, hello, Daniel Chen from Princeton University. And thanks very much for the interesting idea of ostracism. We have a similar work, but not using uh, using eviction, but we're not using negative votes, but use probabilistics based on the current count. Use a small probability to evict. Maybe we can compare that offline. But I have a question. What if you have one un uncompressed sketch and one compressed sketch, and you want to merge them? So if there are two switches, one is not under pressure, so you have a full sketch, the other have a compressed sketch, and you want to merge them, are you forced to merge both of them and lose some accuracy in this case? Okay, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, the compression, if we use two different sketch, and one sketch is compressed, and the, other, and, and the other sketch is not compressed, then how to merge them? This is very interesting. And uh, actually, we only show only when the two sketches have the same size, we can merge them. Actually, when the two sketches have different size, we can first uh, expand, uh, we can copy the sketch, and the two make uh, they are, have the same width then we can merge them. Actually, we, we have studied the algorithm, but uh, there's not enough room in, uh, to let me to write it in the paper. And uh, actually, it can do. We can do it. Okay, thank you very much. Let's discuss offline. Thank you, thank you. Um, Ron from Harvard. Um, you mentioned here that you can do all these tasks, but if I understand correctly, the one that you showed earlier was to do the frequency estimation, right? So estimating the size of flows. So I wanted to ask how can you do cardinality estimation, for example, this, um, this sketch? This sketch. Okay, I, I don't know, so can you repeat your question? Yes, I said that the um, sketch that you showed us, if you can go back a few slides. Okay, back, back. We, um, we, can, go, we can go back. Okay. To the sketch itself. Sketch itself, okay.
I mean a related work of sketch, right? Sorry? I'm saying that uh, you had a slide where you had uh, the, the hash table and the counting sketch, right? Where sure. you first presented the sketch. Yeah, this one. Okay, this one, okay. Uh, so this gives you the size of flows, right? Estimation of uh, the flow sizes. And how from that you get to estimating the number of distinct flows, right? Um, or the other task that you mentioned. Oh, you mean the number of flows? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, um, and, uh, and actually uh, in our, if we want to know the number of flows, and uh, we, here we only use one array. And we use, uh, 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 and we use the algorithm linear counting. And we, we can count the number of uh, value of, of counters with the, uh, the counters that are zero yeah, and the zero ones. ones. And because actually in this term, uh, we, we waste memory because we use counters. And, um, but but uh, because we want to be generic, so we cannot use just bitmap. And uh, actually it is similar. We, we count the number of flows in the using bitmap algorithm. And uh, we also use, uh, uh, for, the heavy, for the heavy part, we can also count the number of elephant flows and we add them up. And for example, entropy, is it also? Okay, in, uh, for the entropy, it is similar. We use the existing algorithms, and uh, it especially in the light part. Therefore, for the number of flows and the entropy, we use more memory. When we, when we use the same memory, uh, our, our algorithm is not uh, as accurate as the existing solutions. But uh, we need to be generic. But uh, um, actually, in, in, uh, in our paper, we can see the experimental results compared to the yeah, I'm, I'm asking if there's a theoretical guarantee for the other tests or is it? Uh, yeah, for the other tests. And all the tests, uh, we, we have a uh, source code in the GitHub. Thank you. Okay, thank you. One last question. Hi, hi. hi. I, want to, uh, I want to ask about light part. Probably we can use n any sketch for la light part, not necessarily CM sketch. Uh, how it affects on uh, accuracy results if, for example, if we use CU sketch for light part instead of CM sketch? Uh, yes, a very good questions. Actually, when we use a CU sketch, the accuracy will be higher. The accuracy will be higher. But uh, when we use only one array CM sketch, be because we want to implement it in, uh, on, on, on hardware platform, because if we use IPG, you cannot choose the smallest counters, because CU sketch will need to choose the smallest counters. Hardware does not uh, permit uh, go back. And for people switch, we do not have enough. Uh, we do not have enough enough number of stages. Stages. So we need to cut the number of arrays. And uh, actually, if we use CU sketch or other sketch, the accuracy will be higher a little, not not so much. So we just uh, use one array, same sketch. Okay. Thank you, Yongkai. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. So we come to the last talk of this session and of this conference. Uh, last speaker is uh, Jun Huang. Uh, Jun is an uh, associate professor at the Institute of uh, uh, Computing Technology at the Institute uh, of, of the Chinese Academy of Science. And uh, his interests are in uh, network measurements, streaming data, and uh, blockchain. Now, even so, he's interested in blockchain. This talk is not about blockchain, and he will talk about a streaming data and application of sketches that makes life sort of easier to configure sketches. Uh, okay, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for your coming for the last talk in the last session in the main conference. And today, I will introduce SketchLearn an intelligent framework to relieve user burdens in approximate measurement. This is a joint work with Professor Patrick Lee from the Chinese University of Hong Kong and Professor Ying Gan Bao, my colleague in the Ch uh, in Chinese Academy of Sciences. 
In this talk, uh, we will address the approximate techniques uh, that have been widely used in network measurement. To utilize these techniques, users configure an algorithm with their knowledge such as expected errors and query parameters. Then the algorithm processes network traffic to generate some results. Existing studies in this area, including sampling techniques and sketch techniques, address to realize different levels of performance accuracy trade-off as introduced by Professor Yang in the last talk. However, approximate measurement introduced some user burdens for practical usage, and our goal in this paper is to identify and relieve such user burdens. The first user burden is specifying the expected errors. Currently, the errors are often characterized by two variables, a, a bias epsilon and a failure probability delta. The two variables means that the approximate result deviates from the true result by at most a factor of epsilon with a high probability one minus delta. So what's your feeling? Obviously, this guarantee is a bit complicated and not straightforward. So setting the two variables for network operations require many domain knowledge. The second user burden is that the configuration needs to know query parameters such as thresholds in advance. If we use a too large threshold, the accuracy will drop significantly for queries with smaller thresholds. Of course, we can always employ a very small threshold for the robustness. However, it's hard to say how small threshold is sufficient because it depends on the specific traffic characteristics and specific management operations. On the, on the other hand, a too small threshold will introduce significant resource consumption and even cancel out the benefit of approx approximate measurement. The third user burden is that even though we know the expected errors and query threshold, it's hard to follow the theory to compute a configuration because many algorithms only provide theoretical analysis for the worst case. If a configuration is calculated based on this worst case analysis, it's usually not truly efficient. However, tuning a configuration to fit the actual scenarios is very labeling. And the fourth burden is that the algorithm only works for a particular flow key. Users can only invoke queries for this flow key. There's no way to switch from one flow key to another unless we deploy two instances of the same algorithm for each flow key independently. And finally, we find that the user specified errors are only predefined for overall flows. However, flows exhibit different errors in practice. For example, a flow may be very lucky that it has no hash collisions with others. In this case, this flow has zero errors. However, existing approaches fail to quantify such extra errors of individual flows. So this is the five user burdens we identify and we want to address them. In this paper, we propose to sketch them. Uh, it's an intelligent framework to relieve such five user burdens, and it also aims to achieve high performance, memory efficiency, and high accuracy. It's general to support various measurement tasks with a unified design and configuration, and this unified design is deployable in both software and hardware. To design the framework, we first analyze the root cause of user burden. In approximate measurement, errors are caused by resource conflicts among flows. So users need to deal with the resource conflicts by carefully tuning the right resource, uh, the right performance accuracy trade-off. However, the resource conflicts are determined by many factors, not only the configuration, but also uh, query parameters, input data characteristics, and flow definition. So if we are looking for a perfect perfect configuration, we need to consider all these factors. This raises the user burden. So in this work, we propose a new methodology for SketchLearn. SketchLearn allows some imperfect configurations that doesn't consider these factors. Of course, such imperfect configuration will cause serious resource conflicts 
and has only very poor accuracy. However, the Jet Shalom uh, will, will learn some inherent statistical properties of resource conflict in, inside this imperfect configuration. Then it will build an intelligent conflict model. If, uh, if, uh, if Sketchler knows this model, he can utilize this model to remove the impact of resource conflict and answer, crit uh, and answer user credits, uh, credits. And eventually, uh, he can significantly improve the accuracy. To realize this high-level idea, we need to address four problems. First, we need a data structure that tolerates imperfect configuration. Second, we need to analyze the statistical properties of resource conflict. And third, we need to build the conflict model. And finally, we need to utilize this model to answer user queries. For the first uh, problem, the design data structure must be very simple, but it should capture sufficient information to support general measurement. In this paper, we employ a multi-level sketch, which is originally published in 2005. In the multi-level sketch, each level is a counter matrix and corresponds to one, flow, one bit in the flow key. In, in these levels, level zero is always updated and level K is selectively updated by a flow if and only if the kth bit in the flow key is one. In all levels, we employ the same hash function so that a flow touches the same bucket in all levels. Here, we show an example of five levels and two rows. In this example, the flow always touches the second bucket in the first row and the fourth bucket in the second row. And apart from level zero, the flow also updates level two and level four because its second and fourth bit are one in the flow key. With this multi-level sketch, the next problem is how to identify the statistical properties of resource conflict in NIST. We find that there are two types of resource conflict in the, uh, the multi-level sketch. First, whether a flow updates level K depends on the inherent distribution of flow keys. And second, whether a flow updates a bucket depends on the hash result. So we need a unifying theory to characterize both the two factors. For the first factor, we introduce a probability to quantify the likelihood that the case bit in the flow key is one. And for the second factor, the sketch counters already reflect the hash collision. And in this work, we introduce a random variable, which is the ratio of counter values in level K to the counter values in level zero. We prove a theorem that if there are no large flows in the multi-level sketch, this random variable will follow a Gaussian distribution with the mean equal to the flow key probability. Then this random variable characterizes both the flow key probability and hash collision. And this theorem also motivates our third problem to build the conflict model. Since the theorem talks about the scenario with no large flows, we are motivated to extract all large flows from the multi-level sketch. Then the remaining flows in the residue sketch are small and the condition for Gaussian distributions is satisfied. However, extracting large flows from the multi-level sketch is very challenging because we even have no guidelines to distinguish large and small flows. Then our solution in this paper is to design a self-adaptive inference algorithm. This algorithm takes the multi-level sketch as input. It first computes some imperfect Gaussian distribution based on the sketch counters. Here we say the distributions are imperfect because there are some large flows in the multi-level sketch. So the conditions for these Gaussian distributions are not satisfied yet. However, we still try to extract some large flows from the multi-level sketch based on these imperfect distributions. If there are some large flows actually extracted, we remove these extracted flows and then refine the Gaussian distributions. Otherwise, if there are no flows extracted, we just use smaller threshold and retry. By repeating this procedure, more and more large flows will be extracted 
and the Gaussian distribution will become more and more accurate. And eventually, this con uh, algorithm will convert. The key procedure in this algorithm is the large flow extraction. Here, our design of large flow extraction is also based on our theorem. Based on our theorem, a large flow is likely to produce some extremely large or small random, uh, values for the random variable R. Or at least uh, the large flow will deviate the random variable from its expectation significantly. So our key idea is to examine all instances of the random variable in the multi-level sketch. Based on their values, we can determine whether there is a large flow recover the flow key and calculate its frequency and flow confidence. Here I just show the high level idea and you may read our paper for more details. Our algorithm is very intelligent because it can cre uh, automatically create a criterion to separate large and small flows. We prove a theorem that for flows above a particular boundary, these flows are guaranteed to be extracted and for flows below this boundary, since our algorithm works iteratively, the algorithm can continue to extract this part of flows with a very small error until no large flows in the remaining sketch and the sketch counters in the residue sketch uh, fit the Gaussian distribution. For example, a 64 kilobyte sketch guarantees to a extract all, large, uh, all flows above 0.6% of total traffic based on our theorem. However, in practice, above 99% of flows exceeding 0.3% of total traffic will be extracted. Our experience is that sketch learn can extract sufficiently small flows for most network operations. So our conflict, uh, our conflict model is composed of two parts. The first part contains some large flows associated with their flow confidence. And the second part is a residue sketch with some Gaussian distributions to characterize uh, the, its sketch counters. And our final problem is how to utilize this conflict model to answer user queries. In fact, by combining the information of the, ex the extracted large flows and the residue sketch, Sketchlum can answer queries for a rich set of flow level statistics. And since the separation of large flow and small flows significantly mitigates the interference among flows, Sketchlum can achieve very high accuracy for these queries. And Sketchlum also provides two extensions. First, Sketchlum supports arbitrary flow keys. This can be implemented by reassembling any levels of inches from the multi-level sketch. And the second extension is that sketch learn can attach an error estimate to the query result based on its confidence of large flows and Gaussian distributions. So this is the whole design of sketch learn architecture. And the key component in this design is the self-adaptive model inference. And this model inference is automatic and transparent to users. So the only slight user burdens in sketch learn is to configure the multi-level sketch. Our experience is that one row is sufficient for sketch learn because it doesn't need multiple hash functions to bound the error probabilities anymore. And for the number of columns, it can be calculated based on the minimal flow or memory budget. This configuration is very straightforward. It doesn't consider any factors such as expected errors or query, query parameters, and it doesn't require any manual tu tuning anymore. We have built a prototype of sketch learn. The major challenge in, uh, in, the, in the implementation is that sketch learn needs to update many levels. And um, this is very time consuming, and our solution is to parallelize the updating because the levels are independent. Our software implementation based on OpenV switch and DPDK utilize the same techniques and our hardware prototype is built on P4 switch. We just distribute, we just distribute the updating into P4 pipeline stages. 
our evaluation shows that such implementations can achieve line rate in both software and hardware platforms. And we also built a simulation platform for large scale experiment. Our experiment used two independent, independent data sets. In our first experiment, we show that Sketchlum can fit its theorem very well. Recall that uh, Sketchlum proved a boundary for large flow extraction. For flows above this boundary, they are guaranteed to be extracted. And for flows below this boundary, uh, they are not guaranteed, but are still likely to be extracted until the counters in the residue sketch fit Gaussian distribution. In this experiment, we compare the theoretical boundaries calculated by our theorem and the actual boundaries measured in uh, our data set. We can see that the difference between the theoretical boundaries and actual boundaries is very small. Since the correctness of the query results depends on the quality of extracted errors, our experiment implies that with our slight user burden, we already obtain a near optimal configuration. And this configuration also works for different types of flow keys. Here we consider three types of flow keys, five tuple, source IP address plus destination IP address, source IP address plus source port number. And in the left figure, we can see Sketchlum can achieve near optimal results for heavy heater detection. And in the right figure, we consider traffic distribution estimation. And we can see Sketchlum has a similarly very low error for all the three types of flow keys. And we have more experiments such as uh, resource consumption and the generality and something else. But since time is limited, I just skip them. And if you are interested, you may read our paper for more details. And to conclude our work, we analyzed five user burdens in existing approximate measurement. Then we designed the Sketchlum framework to relieve such user burdens. It has a multi-level data structure, and we prove a theorem and the distributions about its counters. Then we design a self-adapted model inference algorithm and a extended query model. We build the prototype and conduct many experiments and we will publish our source code. And if you are interested, you may repeat our results. And finally, I will discuss some limitations and future work. The major limitation of Sketchlum is that even though it's memory efficiency, it still consumes too many hardware resources for the, pip for the pipelining update. So we will address this problem in the future. And in the future, we will also study the theoretical anal uh, properties of the resulting Gaussian distributions and the convergence rate of model inference. And we will also address more applications in our future work. And this is all my, my talk, and thanks for your attention. <laughs> Questions? So in the meantime, I, so I have a question on the, on the more theoretical aspect. So the, this theorem works under certain assumptions. Uh, the theorem. What, what are the assumptions that? Okay, the theorem assumes that uh, the distribute. Uh, currently, we assume that there are sufficient small flows so that they can fit. They can fit uh, the Gaussian distributions. So, and this is uh, very typical for most network traffic. So, I mean, so, have, so it seems to be de de depend on the workload. Uh, but uh, in fact, if, uh, uh, if the number of small flows are not, uh, are not, uh, are not that many, and the problem, the problem of large flow extraction will be reduced to a simplified case. So. Uh, so in this paper, our theory uh, depends on the traffic uh, distributions, but in practice, it should work better for uh, for other characteristics. Okay. Okay. Um, have you tried to compare this work against al deterministic algorithms that guarantee that they find the uh, elephant flows like space saving or almost like this? Uh, right, uh, we have compared our approach with uh, many state of the art, and for each measurement task, we will compare at least uh, uh, 
uh, at least several existing algorithms. For example, for heavy heater detection, we compare our approach uh, with counter mean sketch, uh, uh, counter, counter sketch, and the other toy reversible sketch, uh, uniform flow radar, and so on. Danny Chen from Princeton. Okay. Uh, so I have a question about when you use five two process uh, flow key, did you compress it? If not, then you have 104 bytes. Do you use all 104 stages in the sketch? Oh, okay, very good question. Currently, uh, we don't have a specific uh, optimization for this problem. So this is uh, why I discussed the limitation uh, uh, in the last slide. And we will address this problem to compress the multi-level sketch in our future work. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much okay, again. Okay. Uh, this concludes this uh, last session, and I guess I give the, uh, the microphone over to the student competition research chairs. Hello. So welcome to the Student Research Competition Award session. So this, as it is a tradition of SICOM, uh, we run the, comp the Student Research Competition also this year. Um, so let me explain you what is the Student Research Competition. It is uh, a great opportunity for students to come to a, a top venue and present their research, sh sharpen their research agenda, and collect feedback. Uh, so the research competition consists of four stages. So initially, uh, in order to participate in the competition, a student has to submit a two-page extended abstract, which was submitted for the poster and demo uh, at SICOM. So we received uh, 47 submissions at the initial stage, and we selected 23 uh, of these um, two-page abstract to come and we invited them, uh, the SRC invited them to uh, SICOM to the next stage. So the next two stages, they were held at, during the conference. So the first stage was the poster session. This was on Wednesday during the poster and demo, demo session. Uh, so each student could present his poster and we had a panel of jurors that evaluated the posters, ranked them, and we selected the top five uh, students uh, in each category. So we had two categories, undergraduate category and graduate category. So we selected five, uh, the top five students and they advanced to the final stage, which is, yes, yes. So, so we, uh, so they advanced to the final, to the presentation session, which was held this morning. So we had a presentation session for the, the five undergraduate students. And then we had the, the presentation session for uh, so six, and six graduate students. Uh, so based on the evaluation forms, then we selected uh, um, the, we will award the first, uh, the top three students, and the first one will actually compete in the a ACM grand final, which will be held, uh, it's still to be determined. Um, so this event could not, happen without the help uh, of a uh, lot of people that helped us to evaluate the posters and the presentations. So I would be very happy if we could uh, uh, give a round of applause to the jurors who could uh, stand up if they want to. So again, thank you very much for uh, uh, your efforts in evaluating and, uh, uh, the posters and the presentations. Uh, so these are the uh, finalists that this morning uh, uh, presented uh, their work. And we had, uh, as I said, five students in the undergraduate category and six students in the graduate category. And now I will leave the word to Julie for the announcement of the winners. So I have the honor of announcing the winner for the, this year's ACM SRC competition. And before I could announce the winner, I want to add that actually we had a hard time to select the top three on, among the, the finalists. 
and also had a hard time actually rank the, the finalists. But uh, since we only got the gold, uh, silver, and bronze, we can't really award three gold medals or, or two silver medals, one gold medal. So we had to basically force to rank them. So, so when I say the, uh, kind of announce the name, so the student actually come back, come up here. So, so, the, so we start with the undergraduate uh, winners. So the bronze medal winners is Angelo Tulumelo. Like in the Olympics, we're going to give you a medal. Thank you. The, the silver medal winners is Gonzalo Marin. So now the, the gold medalist. Man. Congratulations. I could like the, the other two finalists to come up also. We're gonna take a picture all together. The other two finalists. Yep, they're not here. We actually have a little kind of certificate say you are the finalist. Okay. <laughs> so you are not here, the the Luis, ben, Benjamin Luis and the Ming Lu. Okay. Unfortunately, otherwise have a nice pick. Oh, oh Benjamin here, yeah. <coughs> Congratulations. Just give you a little hint when you're the final. Minlu, is Minlu around? I guess he has left. Okay, now let's move on to the, thank you, congratulations again. Oh, oh okay, <laughs> sorry. To move on to the, you can leave now. Yeah. So we're gonna move on to the graduate winners. Again, we start with the bronze. Pedro Marcos. The silver medal is Marcin Noraki. The gold medalist is Suraj Jock.
So again, we'd like to ask the other three finalists to come up on uh, stage so we can take a picture together. So thank you. So, so can we take a picture? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. So, to finally, the, but not um, the last one. This, uh, if you are a student in the audience, I would encourage you to to actually submit, uh, consider participating in next year's SRC competition. If you're faculty, try to encourage encourage your student to submit. Also, I'm actually the co-poster chair for next year, so your submission could be considered at at the same time as the other poster. So, please do submit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for staying so long. Um, even though these days pass very quickly, you do a lot of work for many, many months, and then you know, suddenly it's over. So basically, when we started this uh, uh, conference on Tuesday morning, we are full of uncertainties how it's going to unfold. I mean, you work and uh, work and work day and night, and then it all ends up in complete disaster, and you don't know what's going to work and what doesn't going to work. And, uh, uh, you have to fix everything on the <coughs> on the fly. So, uh, so when we uh, gave this welcome presentation in the beginning, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen. So it was, it was basically hypothesis and preliminary result. So now we have much more certainty. So this is essentially <coughs> revisiting CCOP 2018 and giving you some more, I don't know, uh, proofs, quantitative results. <laughs> rehashing some of the original presentations and the, and the uh, pictures. So registration, so you already saw that slide if you were in the morning. So Alex Snorren opened the initial congestion window, being a, I know, MSS number one, then we have the slow start of uh, early registration, and uh, congestion avoidance of um, late registrations, and it, the thread continued, so we got, you know, about 20 more registrations over these three days. So the final count as of now is 739, which might go a bit more after some more people will register for workshops tomorrow morning. Um, I know that slide you also saw, uh, steering dinner 1999, uh, when Dina Katabi and I ended up sitting across each other at, the, at Harvard uh, during the student dinner. And uh, of course, I know there is fate, you, know, you, you cannot deny it. So basically this week there was a awards dinner and of course uh, dinner came last and she had, no choice but she had no choice but sit next to me. So we don't have a picture this time to prove that it happened, but it did and Dina asked uh, ask me at that dinner two questions that subsequently were asked by a few other people. Uh, one of that, why, I know, why did I, I know, volunteer to do these things because it's a huge amount of work and it's thankless and you know, what do you get out of it? All right, and the second question, know, what does the logo mean? Um, so essentially, I, you know, I'll try to provide some insights in, uh, into two questions. Let's start with logo. 
So what I, no, this preliminary qualitative result, uh, no, answer I gave to Dina at the dinner, I said, well, uh, no, it's, it doesn't really matter uh, no, what artist thought when drawing the logo because it's, uh, no, in art, it's what basically the viewer sees in the logo. That's what's important. Uh, right, so I'm not sure Dina was completely satisfied with this, but uh, uh, that was a little bit of a purpose of uh, the evaluation feedback form that many of you filled out during the previous, uh, I know, previous sessions and uh, I know, to my big surprise, I know, many people thought it's a chain bridge. Uh, um, to me it was I know, I know, seemingly obvious that it was some feminine figure, but uh, <laughs> uh, those who saw chain bridge probably were right in their, in, in their own, in their own uh, way. So, the right answer, I don't know if there is no right answer, is it's, uh, it was Statue of Liberty or uh, strictly speaking Liberty Statue on the Gellers Hill in Budapest. So those of you who you know, boarded the boat yesterday uh, on the ramp and looked to the left across the river, there was Gellers Hill and on the top of uh, Gellers Hill there is a uh, statue. Those who went to student dinner could see it uh, uh, in the right in the right aspect, in the right, uh, in the right angle. So the picture on the right is the picture of the stage I took yesterday myself from the uh, banquet ball. Um, so there is, uh, I think, some similarity. So the, the, the original, the concept was developed by our uh, glorious web chair, Leventus Sikor. But then, uh, I know, I, uh, we had some discussions I made kind of hard executive decision that you know, to match the technical excellence of the uh, overall conference, we should have some big done professionally. So essentially based on the same concept, uh, uh, the logo was redesigned by Bandi Laszlo, who is the greatest Hungarian artist I met in person. So, <laughs> and in addition, he did this for free. Uh, uh, and uh, then we pay, pay the, some nominal fee to his daughter and also graphic designer by profession, uh, uh, Zuzi Laszlo. And later we use it for advertising uh, the conference in June and July issues of communications of the uh, communications of ACM, um, which I hope also contributed to the high turnout of this uh, conference. And uh, I, uh, if somebody actually really wonders what it means, I did ask Bandi, I know, what it means, and in particular what these green, I know, green circles mean. So there's no really big surprise. I know he said that's supposed to uh, represent interconnectedness of networks. Okay, and um, I don't know, I know it's, I know, may I share my own opinion, and uh, it's something that even my co-chair, Janusz, doesn't know, so it's going to be a surprise for him, for him as well. Uh, so you, you saw that slide, and I, I told you on Tuesday that we decided to, uh, that we want to organize the conference three years ago uh, on the Lake Balaton. And then, um, uh, I don't know, this beautiful emerald waters of Balaton, but, uh, and it's nice to go there and have nice summer day, but I know my mindset was not that sunny at that time. Uh, uh, my personal story that uh, uh, the cancer of my wife came a year before that and uh, the out, you know, outlook was much worse. And uh, actually when you know, we discussed it with Janusz at the retreat of his research group that we want to do it, actually I uh, seriously was afraid that uh, I know, by the time actually SICOM will happen, you know, it's going to be bittersweet. Uh, uh, tribute to a very special person for me. But um, sometimes life is not dramatic, it's uh, actually quite happy, so uh, my wife uh, has been very healthy, happy, and I know, as beautiful as ever uh, this year. So essentially, instead of bittersweet tribute, it was happy celebration, joyful celebration of life. So that was a passion that was you know, driving me through this <laughs> many months of organizing the conference, and um, uh, we're very happy that the result of the feedback from your forms, 
we should collect within this afternoon. Um, the CICOM being the leading conference in computer networking research, it's only unavoidable that Wi-Fi was the worst aspect uh, of the conference. Uh, and um, unfortunately, you have to rely on people. So Bigado is wonderful uh, concert hall, and uh, the uh, record and stream wonderful music uh, performances from here. But when they said that, don't worry, we have dedicated internet, I know we'll support <laughs> internet connectivity to the highest standards. I think they just didn't know <laughs> what it means when there are 600 nerds with two devices <laughs> uh, show up in the room. Uh, the best path was Budapest, which is also very comforting because it's a beautiful city. I always like to come here, and it's nice that many of you came and uh, had good time uh, to discover it for yourself. Uh, and comfortably, from one to 10, we did quite well. So. It couldn't be perfect, but overall, we like the score you gave us, and uh, uh, also uh, we were heartened by uh, comments you wrote in the forms. And again, Budapest is the winner, so I uh, hope that uh, executive committee does regret that in the decision to, to pick Budapest over other wonderful places in the world uh, to host us. And, uh, uh, it's not over, so the main conference is over, but tomorrow we have five more workshops. Uh, we have the most popular workshop, NetAI, we have uh, uh, Sexon, and then we have ERC Networking Symposium, and also we have a double combination uh, of VR, AR in the morning and self-driving uh, self uh, networks workshop on, uh, uh, in the afternoon. And that's pretty much concludes my comments, so I guess. As usually, uh, I like to repeat, you know, in our, on our team of general chairs, I'm a talker and Janos is a thinker. Uh, so maybe Janos can say some words you know, to, to conclude the conference. So we are very happy that the conference was so successful and, and we got some good marks and I really hope that you enjoyed the, the trip to the conference and uh, we, we did a lot of planning and a lot of uh, work behind to, to make it happen and to, to make it, because uh, it's a very large conference to compare to the city or I would say we do not have, a, for example, a larger venue in, in, in this, uh, which, which is such a nice venue. And uh, I really hope you enjoyed, and I think the only thing is left is that I, I should close the conference. So thank you.